The word gospel means good news. So there I am bringing the, the word of Jesus down right, right here. And I'll read a lesson like that. And I'll say the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm looking up and all of you are wincing. <laughs> if we look at that gospel lesson at face value, it is not good news. It's terrifying news. It's fierce news. It's dreadful news. Lazy slave, cast him into outer darkness. Now I know that some of you were reared on those kind of sermons and you even missed them. <laughs> if we were to take this, this gospel lesson literally, I would invite us to flee. But we ought not to take this lesson literally because Jesus is not a literalist. Leanne, that one's for, for you. All right, good. He's not a literalist, and it's a, it's a really good thing. He tells these stories, these fierce stories, in order to make usually one point. And he tells them in this way because sometimes we fall asleep. Amen? Sometimes we're not paying attention. How many times did you have to ask your children to clean their room? The one point of this lesson is really quite simple and very important. God blesses us with talents. At this point, it's a certain amount of money, but it morphs into talents, abilities. Talents, abilities, skills, gives them to us, and he wants, he desires, God expects us to use those talents, share those talents, invest in those talents, like the first two guys, and not be like the third guy who buried the talent. Because the talent didn't do anybody any good. And before any one of you feel sorry for that one guy who only got that one talent, Eric was raising his hand, before you feel sorry, don't feel sorry, Eric, that's 15 years worth of salary. One. So it's not a cheap gift. In other words, God is lavish. God is not a miser. Now, a couple things you need to know before I get into the parable. This is two days before Jesus is going to be arrested. So there's a certain urgency. Like, this is my last chance to get through. The other part is, it's political, is the person who buried the one talent, it's an accusation against the scribes and the Pharisees because Jesus believed that they had buried the Word of God under 638 laws. So it's a complaint against them, it's a castigation against them, a condemnation of them, but also Jesus, Jesus is desperate to get the Word through. So, here we are, parable, four questions. Do we all bury our talents? Second question. Why do we bury our talents? Third question. How do we bury our talents? Fourth question. What are we going to do about it? This is a sermon series. We're going to be here until this afternoon. All right. <laughs> do we all bury our talents? Yes. Or at least I've not met anybody who doesn't. I'm, I've been looking. I don't see them yet. Don't we all lose our way? Aren't we all sometimes tempted to give up? Aren't there days we just want to pull the covers up over our head? That's, that can be a metaphor. And just not get out there. Ever want to butt, batten down the hatches? Ever want to just throw in the towel? Ever think, what, what am I doing? Ever think, is that all there is? Anybody here who's the exception to that? Come see me. Coach me, will you? Please don't think that because you have sometimes buried your talent, you're unique. You're not. It's a very level playing field. 
And if we look back at our lives and look at all that we wasted and all that we buried and want to get into the shame and the guilt, don't go there. It won't do you any good. The question is not have you. Yes, we have. The question is, are you doing so now? And if you are, what does Jesus want you to do? Second question. Why do we bear our talents? There are more reasons than I can recount. And my darling wife, Lucy, the psychiatrist, could say a lot about that. <laughs> She's not here today, but anyway, I, I can feel her presence. Why do we bear our talents? I know one guy who buried his talent because his father told him his whole life that he was never going to amount to anything. I know a woman who buried her talents and abilities because she was abused by a husband. I know somebody else who buried his talents because he was betrayed by one of his best friends and he lost work that was very precious to him. Most of the time we don't intentionally bury our talents, but what happens to us is life. And life is hard. Life's wonderful, and life is hard. And we all show up with scars and wounds, and some of us are hemorrhaging straight from our hearts right now. So life happens, and we begin to try to protect ourselves, thinking if, if only we get below the radar, nothing more bad will happen. And that's magical thinking, but it makes perfect sense. Why do we bury ourselves? Last night at 10 o'clock, I get a text from somebody, member of our congregation, I'll call him George, not his name, and says, Father, I need you to speak about something in a sermon. I'm thinking it's kind of late. I'm, I'm done. You know, I think I'm done. He said, uh, when my mother died, my dad got depressed. I'm speaking to you, and I'm speaking here. When the dog dad, when my dog died, my dad got more depressed, and now he's drinking, he's angry at God, he's going under, say something to him, Father. Well, bring your dad in. Have him come see me, we'll sit right here. And your dad can say anything God he needs to say. I'll listen to it all. And then I pray we can begin to hear God's presence and of his life saying, do not die. For your sake, for your son's sake. That's a man who has buried himself under grief, depression, alcohol, And I'm going to say that most of us understand that on some level, if not ourselves, somebody in our family, and the layers, the layers of pain continue, and we bury. So how do we bury? I have seen people bury their talents and bury their lives under anger. In fact, these people are angry when they're not angry. And if they don't have anything to be angry about, they dream up something to be angry about. Anger is their modus operandi. I'm, how am I going to, they wake up, how am I going to be angry today? I've seen some people bury their talents, bury their lives under resentment. Somebody's always got it better. Life's unfair. And they just get into the wine. They get into the wine and resent the whole world. And they bury their talents. I've seen people bury their talents and abilities under envy. They think somebody's got more. And the problem with that is when they're looking at that person with more, they're not looking at what they actually do have. So we're ripping them down to who we are and what we can do. 
I've seen people completely bury themselves in the political arena. I've seen people on the far, far right and the far, far left completely lose their minds and hearts and walk around with a club in their hands. And I've probably offended, um, anyway, Grace, I've gotten everybody, so I'm not taking sides. But if you're watching this news all the time or that news all the time, stop. Get on your knees and listen to the good news of God. (laughs) Would that I could say that. Anyway, to a larger audience, yeah, I'm talking to you out there. All right. So what are we going to do? If I not hooked you all yet. Are you all in this with me? You're not reading the bulletins, are you? (laughs) I'm looking around. (laughs) So what are we going to do? Do you want to die before you die? Do you want to die before you die? Do you want to die before you die? Did God give us all these talents and abilities that we bury them and die? No. So what kind of business are we in? Well, one way we can say it is that because of Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose for us, we're in the resurrection business. And the resurrection business is not our last day on this earth going forward. The resurrection business is now. The power of the resurrection can work here and now in our lives, and we all need it without exceptions. And we come here, we come here to be raised up. We come here to be unburied. We are in the excavation business. I almost called Senior Warden on my way in here this morning. I said, Jeffrey, I'm going to need a prop for the sermon. But I, I, I got, got over myself. And, and, and Bring a shovel. <laughs> But we're here to unbury each other because we need each other. There's not one of you, not one of you, who can do this walk by themselves. You can't. We need to be in community and we need to say that God has blessed everybody here and all the gifts of everybody here are going to contribute to the common life of this place because you're not here to be passive. You're not here to simply receive and kind of, you know, receive again and receive again and not pour forth your gifts. That's not how the body of Christ works. I've seen some people say, God, I'm so tired of hearing this. After 40 years, I'll ask them to do something. I feel like you're called to do Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, killing me. I'm not worthy. Well, no, you're not. Nobody is. Jesus makes us worthy. There it is. So you are worthy because of what he's done. Get over yourself. Step up. That's a false piety. Oh, I'm not good enough. That's false piety. And it gives no glory to God. I've also had some people in the the Christian life who think that their gifts are just like just a little bit more important than everybody else's gifts. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. <laughs> and that, when, when people act like that in the body of Christ, you actually do damage to the body of Christ. We're all important. We've all got gifts. Be strong enough to give somebody else a chance to use their gifts. So, going back to the parable you will see that the master is angry at the end. Does God get angry when we bury our gifts and bury our lives? Think about this. We got any parents here? 
Some of you could look a little happier. <laughs> yeah, the, the doll babies can break your heart. Think about this as a parent. If you see one of your children bearing their talents and abilities in their life, can you be angry sometimes? Yes. But deeper than the anger is disappointment. And deeper than that is grief. Heart-rending grief. You see this child, you love this child, you see the gifts and the potential in this child, and you see all that's lost and wasted and gone. And you think the world is missing so much. Imagine the grief that God has. But let's remember, that's not all of the story. What happens with the first one and what happens with the second one? They invested their talents. They made more talents. When the master came back, they were so excited. Master, 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 look what I did. Look what happened here. Look, 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 look. And the master says, well done. Enter into the joy of your master. St. John's. We're called to invest the talents that we've been given because there's been a lot of energy around here for a really long time that's been buried. Time to unbury it so that together we can hear, well done. Well done. Enter into the joy of the Master. Listen very deeply. And you will hear the Master beginning to say those words to us. Even now. Even sometimes in the midst of the challenging days. And the green tape on the floor and whatever is not going on around here. The master is saying, looking at our life from a year ago today, the master is saying, well done, keep it up. Unbury to the glory of God and to the joy of our hearts. Amen.